Are you saying that a vine that lives in Christ, God cuts off? The word is iro, like arrow, but iro. Here is how it's translated in another place. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples, I rode, picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. They didn't cut off the broken pieces. It's good to see everybody this morning. <clears throat> this is a topic that I've been uh, thinking on for a little while, and it's one that uh, has really impacted me a little bit as I've been getting older. Um, my birthday is coming up next week, and... Uh, the older we get, we have a tendency to reflect on things, and this is a topic that um, I've been meditating on it. There's been something I've been trying to, to do and practice in my, uh, my life, and it's meditative prayer. It's basically picking a prayer or a verse and just praying it over and over again. A lot of the monks would do this, but it allows for you to just to think of different concepts of that verse or prayer that you're doing. Um, the Lord's Prayer is a great one to do. Um, if you're struggling in your prayer life, it's a great way to focus back in and praying again and just pray it. And you may pray the entire thing. You may spend a week on Our Father. You may spend a week on just R, and you just go through it and think about different ways and meditate on it as you're doing it. And one of the things that I've been meditating on and thinking about is a little bit of Psalms 1. And in Psalms 1, it says, And you shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Listen again. And you shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You begin to think on that for a while, and you begin to Put theology behind it. Does this match what I think? Do I actually believe what this is saying? Before I dive in, I do want to say a word of prayer just to gather our mind. Father God, help us this morning to focus in on your word, to try to align our life and what we look at in our everyday life to what the text says so we can understand it better and have a better context of what we're supposed to do for you. In Messiah's name, amen. This verse is one that I'm sure you've heard a lot, especially the last part. That one jumps out all the time. Whatever your hand does, it's going to prosper. Please send $1,000 to this email address immediately so I can deposit in my bank account. That seed for you will be planted and grow, and you're going to get 10 times back. You listen to these... TV evangelists, or now Instagram preachers or YouTube preachers. And they paint such a beautiful picture with their teeth whitened, their hair curled, their $10,000 suits. It sounds good. It looks good. They talk about joy and bliss and this concept that everything is Rose petals and daisies. <clears throat> and then the questions come. Why didn't my $1,000 come back? Why didn't I get healed? Why am I having to walk through the darkness? Some of us will understand this more than others. We look at this and we see a weapon. Are you bearing fruit? Have you been fruitful? How's your harvest this year? If you haven't brought one person to Christ in the last 12 months, you can't be saved. And we've heard that. They emphasize fruit production quotas. 
balance sheets, quality control systems, analyzing the fruit, talking about those who aren't bearing fruit the right way. Saying that the fruit that's not grown on their particular branch of religion isn't, isn't right. That's weaponized. Because we're in love with the American dream, we have bled that over into our concept of what it means to bear fruit. The pursuit of wealth, the desire for a more efficient system, a higher productive system, going out and making as much fruit as possible. It bleeds into the church world. God can't be moving if more fruit isn't happening. And production is the focus. We look at the assembly line, try to get rid of parts of it that isn't just doing what we think it needs to be doing. Here in the mid of Indiana, we have a large factory nearby, Sun Gold Tomatoes. But most of the tomatoes in America come out of Florida. And they've discovered something in Florida that if you plant tomatoes in sand and feed it very specific nutrients, only the nutrients that it needs to produce fruit, it will do it, and they will all be about the same size consistently. They've also discovered that if they can pick the fruit when it is just now green, a hard green tomato at a certain size, they can load it up in semis, dump it in, and they won't get damaged. They're harder than rocks. And they can ship them all over the United States. Then they put them in a warehouse, fill the warehouse with ethylene gas, and force ripen the tomato. We wonder why they don't taste like tomatoes. (laughs) But we do this in the church model. We look at producing fruit as much as we can, and we create a structure to get people to come in and confess and believe, and it looks like fruit. We grab the fruit, throw it on something, put it up front, try to get it in front of production, try to force it to grow, and we wonder why it doesn't taste right or it rots or it soon is destroyed. Those of us that have grown in this up in a church model that has abused some of this concept of of fruitfulness will remember some of the sermons about sinners in the hands of an angry God and this concept that God is just toying almost with lives. And at a whim, we'll just cast them in this lake of fire, and you can even smell it. They're so brilliant in their wordsmithing and so, so strong in how they're able to make this come alive that you're just dangling over hell. And what happens is it's not just the sinners that are getting rudely awakened. It's the believers that are going, wait a minute here. What about me? I don't feel like I've produced enough fruit this year. I don't feel like I'm doing what I need to be doing. But in pondering this concept of fruit bearing and what it means, I come to this question, who is responsible for the fruit? who's, Who's the one that dictates production? When we start pondering this, it'll change your worldview. If you start understanding who ultimately is responsible for this enterprise, this church, we begin to think of things differently. Genesis 1 starts something uh, very, very interesting, because it says that God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, Moedim. Ponder this for a moment. Does your theology have seasons in the garden, pre-fall, pre-sin? Ponder that just for a moment. Are you saying that God created the earth to have seasonality built into it? That God is a God of seasonality, not 70 degree paradise temperatures, greenhouse effect, nothing changed it. It was always sunny in South Florida. 
Or do you have a concept of a God that created it with seasons? Something that has changed to it. Variety. Pre-fall. Pre-sin. Seasons. I, I, I know that's a simple concept, but I really want you to get that because when we look at ourselves, we don't see that. We think we always got to be producing the fruit all the time. And God saw that it was good. Seasons are good. When you look in the mirror and see the next season, is it good? In the, in, in the garden, there's a very interesting tree. There's something amazing about this tree because it produces fruit. And Revelation 22 brings this tree back into this concept, and it says that it produces fruit, 12 different types of fruit, for 12 different months. Just side note, my Jewish mindset bothers me here because the Jewish calendar is 13 months. The Roman Julian calendar has 12. You'll get that. But do you realize that the tree of life has 12 different types of fruit producing all the time? And I think we in our Christian lives look at this tree and go, that's what I need to be. It doesn't matter when, in season or out of season, we're going to be pushing out the fruit. We're going to be doing the best we can do. It's going to be A grade. And this is the picture that we get as believers of what kind of fruit we have to do and have to produce. So who's responsible for the fruit? Why did God create seasons? And are we supposed to be continually producing this fruit all the time? It says that Christ was teaching, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will even be even more fruitful. Now, meditate it through it. Sit down with each word. Who is the true vine? Christ. He's saying, I am the true vine. Who's the gardener? God is the gardener. Have you thought about the gardener? I know, I think it was almost a year ago now, I talked about a gardener named George. Because in Greek, it's George, it means he's the gardener. How much better, how much more educated, how much more skillful... How much more amazing of a gardener can you get than the creator of the garden? He knows everything about it. He's been with it for, for, since the beginning. There's a verse that says, Let me sing about the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stone and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. And then he looked for good grapes. Do you realize that this gardener chose the location of the vineyard? He chose what vine he's going to plant. Loved it so much that he builds a watchtower and is guarding out to make sure no one comes in and destroys the vineyard. Constantly looking, constantly watching, never slumbering, never sleeping, constantly keeping his eye on this garden. Does your theology about fruit bearing match that concept? 
Do you understand that God has planted the vine in which you are placed into? It is the perfect vine. Hand-selected, hand-crafted from himself. Do you understand what your role is in this fruit-bearing enterprise? Did you have any say on where this vine was planted? Were you a part of the decision-making about where, how, when this vine is planted? Are you responsible for pruning the vines? Are you on the committee that grades the fruit at production? Kicking it out, bringing it in. Are you on the watchtower, making sure everything's okay? See, this gardener is there to make sure it produces fruit. Do you understand that the gardener is there to make sure you produce fruit? Grasp it. Live like this in your mind. Constantly remind yourself that I have a gardener that is making sure that I produce fruit. If you want to have freedom in Christ, grasp the idea that there is somebody that loves you more than you love yourself. Knows more about you, can nurture and care for Feed it, guide it, make sure everything is right. There's somebody that loves you more than you love yourself. Often when you're in the seasonality of life, those dry, hot summer days, when you don't feel like you can take it, when you don't feel like it's going to work out, that you just can't do this, what's the gardener doing? Watching, making sure rain's going to come. Why? He's in charge of the rain. Maybe those long, cold, dark winters, when you just barely can make it, you feel like you're dormant. You just don't feel like there's life in the vine like there used to be. What's happening? What is the gardener doing? He's watching, caring for, and, and keeping this vine growing and producing the fruit. But if we don't pay attention, what we fall back into is, is some of those thought patterns that we had before. We see a gardener with a steel chainsaw getting ready to fire it up and cut off any branch that he just doesn't like that day. Throw it out on the side, throw gasoline on it, torch it, and walk away. When we read this verse, it reinforces that mindset that we've had because it says he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Are you saying that a vine that lives in Christ, God cuts off? Watch our theology. <laughs> Does your theology want to agree with that? You're in Christ and God cuts you off? The word is iro. Iro, like arrow, but iro. Here is how it's translated in another place. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples, I rode, picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. They didn't cut off the broken pieces. Simon the Cyrene, during the, the, when Christ is carrying the cross, they compel him to come and they force him to I row the cross. He's not cutting off the cross, he's lifting it up. I row. The problem is the translators didn't have a concept of I row and this concept of cut off like they did in ancient times. There's two ways to, to grow grapes. One, you see in modern day, there's trellises, there's fence posts and a lot of electrical wire, and you see everything tied up off the ground. But they didn't have wires and T-posts from Rural King that they could go get. So grapevines grew on the ground. It's the weirdest thing when you first see this. Really old grapevines just laying on the ground. 
But anybody that has tried to grow grapes or been around grapes, you realize there's one important thing with grapes. They cannot touch the ground. They touch the ground, fungus is going to happen. Insects are going to happen. Be'ashim, stunted, rotten fruit. Now, how do we look at this verse and go, wait, I've been told all my life that if you're not producing fruit, you're cut off. Are you telling me that there's a gardener that wants to lift up a branch that's struggling, trying to make this more productive? It says it's in me. Christ literally says, this branch is in me. I'm going to eye roll. I'm going to lift it up. And you will see it. You can see it here in this picture, a rock underneath the main branch. And they'll get twigs and rocks and different things and prop this thing up. Because God, the gardener, is desperately trying to get this thing to produce fruit. But we want the instant fruit. If we don't see fruit on our vine, we're, we're scared. What is God going to do? Those of us are, are getting older, I know I'm not that old yet. Some of you are looking at me and laughing. But those of us that are getting older look back on the days when we first got started. Man, growth was easy. You want to talk about fast growth. We were putting on leaves. We were shooting out. We were, we were just growing like crazy. But the older we got, it seemed like the growth slowed down. It seemed slower. Something seems to change. If you understand how grapevines grow, it takes time for them to get established. It takes years before they begin to grow. We in America have forced this a little bit more with our farming standards, obviously. But normally the old standards was until they're 30 years old, they weren't supposed to be used for wine because they just weren't ready yet. They didn't have a deep enough taste to it. Some parts of the world, it wasn't until they were 100 years old before they could start producing fruit. But in our instant mindset, we have forced this and pushed this to say, no, it should be immediately. It should, it should be now. I want it right now, constantly. And God's saying, wait a minute here. I'm the gardener. It takes root. We've got to get those roots way down in. You've got to get tied into that vine that, so the deepness of the flavor can come through. If I look at the, the journey of my life, it's zigzags everywhere. Yes, I know it's my personality too, but it zigzags. And I'm like, God, how in the world is this going to come together? How in the world is that going to result into anything? And he's just there pruning Shaping, lifting up, and the seasons. Man, there's a lot of them. Some that you just come out of the blue. You're like, man, I was, I, I thought this year was a fruit bearing year, God. I, I thought it was again, pruning again. <laughs> But God's responsible. He created the seasons. He knows the vine. He knows what he wants it to look like. He knows what kind of fruit he needs when he needs it. We just have to hang on to the vine. Got to remain in him. It's the only thing we're, we're able to do. Only thing we're able to do is stay attached to the vine. And those of, the, of us that are walking this every day, that is the only thing we have to do. If you are in the vine, everything else is up to the gardener. I'm sure some of you have planted tomatoes. How much of the tomato blossoms are you going to pinch off? Or these, are you going to pinch this off? Are you going to pinch that off? Why? You understand, I want this to grow a certain way. With grapevines, you trim it off. I've got to cut it back this year. Because we understand it. 
in the Midrash, there was a concept of understanding that fruit is different each season. Every season, there's a different type of fruit. Do we realize that it's impossible for us to bear last year's fruit? The good old days are gone. Never to return. If we try to, rep- to produce last year's crop, we will fail. It's impossible. Why? It's a different season. It's been sunnier this year than last year. It's been wetter this year than last year. The gardener trimmed the tree differently this year. Now, is it still a vine? Is it still grapes? Is it still the fruit? Absolutely. But getting a vintage 1923 wine to grow in 2024 isn't going to happen. It doesn't matter what we do. But we can't focus just on the past. In Israel, I love just the natural side of it. You see it. You can walk up to the grapevine. You can walk up to the olive tree. You can walk up to the acacia tree, and it's just there. The lessons are right there. But this tree, I... It bothered me for a while because I couldn't understand it. It's a weird tree. If you look at the trunk, it looks old, weathered, seasoned, scratched, dented, knotted up. It's a weird-looking tree. But if you look at the canopy, it looks young, vibrant, bright green. And inside of it are these pods, these beans that are growing This is what you see in the biblical story when it talks about locusts. This is a locust tree. So John the Baptist is out in the backside of the desert eating locusts and wild honey. Interpret that as he's eating carob beans and devosh, honey from dates. So it's a date jam and this. You can eat them raw or you can grind them up and those of you that are health conscious you probably actually can see this before they will take the beans grind them up and put them into flour and make bread so john the baptist is eating bread and jam <laughs> story doesn't sell nearly as much as locust and honey not saying that he didn't eat honey and, and locust may have just locusts are oddly not in that area. <laughs> um, but he's eating this. This is also what the prodigal son in that story, the parable, is eating the husks. The very high nutrient dense food. But these, these trees and these locust pods, it's a tree that takes a really, really long time to grow. So, um, you probably remember the book, The Circle Maker. And he talks about this rabbi. One of his stories, I don't know if it's in the book or not, but he's, he was, it says that he was walking through a village and he saw a, a man planting a carob tree. And says, what are you doing? He's like, I'm planting a carob tree. He's like, don't you realize like, you're like 80 years old? Why are you planting a carob tree? It, it's not going to grow fast enough for you to to eat of its fruit. And the man said, when I was born and walked this land, my grandparents had planted carob trees for me. So I'm planting carob trees for them. But, but this, this fruit, is, it's weird. I, when, I, when I was walking, I'd always see this tree and there was always green fruit on it. Always. And I always heard that you wait until they're brown, and you can eat them like candy. It literally tastes like a Tootsie Roll. These have been around for a while. They're not going to taste that way. <laughs> if you want to gnaw on one, there's some up here you can gnaw on. But they, they're, they're literally the candy of the desert. You just pop in your mouth and chew on them, and it, it's sweet. But I can never find the brown ones. It's like, why in the world is there always green carob beans on this? 
And then I begin to, to research it a little bit, and then I realize that this tree, plant, or when, it, when it blossoms, it sets the pod, and it takes 11 months for it to ripen. 11 months. And then there's a window that it's ripe while it's getting ready to set the flowers for the next year. So you'll, be, you'll start seeing ripe beans and the flowers, and you're like, what is this tree? Why does it take so long? In America, we push things so hard. We want it to be now. But the stages of fruit bearing are often very, very long. We don't get to choose that. In your life, there may be one season that God says, that, that period right there, i got to have them. In your life, you don't realize what's going on. And then it just comes clear at that point, God, okay. And in its season. But it's hard to let fruit mature. It's hard going to the store and buying green bananas and waiting to get home. As you buy the ripe ones, you won't even fast enough. <laughs> we want it now. We want it all. And in church, it's hard not to do the same. Let's focus on new fruit production. But we're not looking at this 100-year-old vine and realizing the depth, the undertones, the time that it was spent in the seasons now to bear forth this fruit. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. To declare, declare the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. I see this over and over again, that we look at the older saints I'm not saying here, but I'm just saying as a movement, as a church, you hit 55, you hit 60, and we look at us saying we need new young blood in here. We need this new, new, this new wave. And I think God the gardener is going, but it's just getting good. It's, it's just getting those, those deep, heavy things in it. It's the season that the production can be amazing. And those of us that have been around the older saints, we realize they're just filled with amazing wisdom. You sit with them, you talk with them, and you realize the depth that's there. The time that God has given them and, and poured himself into it and molded them and, and just pruned them to be what God wanted them to be. Because we all know the older the root, the better the fruit but we try to rush it. We try to push it. So who's responsible for the fruit? Why did God create seasons? And what do we need to do? We dwell in him. That's all. There's nothing else we can do. No quotas, no production schedules, no fruit shaming, no guilt no production, not ours to worry about. We just drink deeply from the source. Paul, in dealing with the new, new believers in this issue with the, 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 the church in Colossians, says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Stay in Jesus. Stay rooted in him. Don't let these worldly philosophies dictate what you think. Don't let them tear down the supports Move the rocks. Change how the gardener has set up the garden. Those are become hollow, deceptive philosophies that ruin the fruit. 
but rest in the gardener. Fully rest, and it says, be thankful. Just as I started by saying, I've been focusing on contemplative prayer, I've also been trying to do it with thankfulness. In prayer, short, repetitive prayer, thanking him continually. You get busy, you get your mind back for a moment, thank God for the gardener. Thank him for taking care of it. Thank him for his responsibility in this, for loving. If we do, it says, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bears fruit in its season. Let's stand. Father God, thank you for being our gardener. Thank you for making it possible that we can be grafted into the vine, being adopted into this vine, this life-giving source. Thank you for handling the weather, the seasons. And yes, thank you for the seasons because you doeth all things well and you called it good. Help us to understand that. Help us to recognize that it's good. We can rest in you and look at production as it's all on you. We're resting in that and it's good. Amen. Amen.